top of page 13, we're, we're talking about cursing the fig tree. And if we take the, take the main phrase out of this particular thing that Jesus says to his disciples um, and retranslate it, making an application in some various different ways, we say, if you have faith and do not disqualify yourself or someone else, you can do miracles like these. I, uh, I'm beginning, because I've been thinking about doubt for some time, I'm beginning to hear doubt and sometimes when people make statements about other things. Uh, for instance, talking to a wife about a husband, a wayward husband, you know, and I start encouraging her perhaps that she could pray and her husband would come into the kingdom and, and you hear things like this, well, you just don't know my husband. You know, and what she's doing is she's disqualifying him. You just don't know my son. Uh, and I said, well, God does, and uh, you're telling me your son is too hard for God to get to deal with? See, we, we have a tendency sometimes to think in terms of disqualifying people from the grace of God. But the truth is, is that God's grace actually, because of what Jesus has done at the cross, not only meets them in healing, but also meets them in salvation. That, that nobody is too hard for the Lord. All things are possible to him who believes. So don't quit believing for your unsaved loved ones. Don't disqualify them. The, the, they, they may react to you, but you know what? They may not react to the Lord at all. You know, there is a difference. <laughs> if you have faith and don't judge yourself outside the grace of God, you can have a reliable ministry of healing. If you have faith and don't discriminate against yourself for any reason, you can experience what 12 ordinary men who follow Jesus Christ experience. For any reason, whatever reason is in your head that tells you you can't do this, that's doubt working. You're disqualifying yourself in some sort of way. Uh, some of us have a little gray hair, um, white hair in some cases. And uh, I want to remind you that uh, the Apostle John historically did not become very, very fruitful in ministry. His most fruitful years were after he was 80 years old. He lived to be over 100. In the last 20 years of his life, he, had, he was very, very fruitful in ministry. So if you think just because you have a little gray hair uh, that somehow or another you, God can't get a hold of you and you do healing ministry and be successful in getting your friends, neighbors, relatives healed, uh, well, think again. You don't get to retire in the kingdom. You just get to refire. If you have faith and don't believe that you're the special exception, you can receive what others receive. James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8 also talks about doubt. Here it says, if, you lack, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Uh, this is one of the areas, by the way, that doubt really works, and I can see why James talks about this. In the culture of the American church, I would guess that three-quarters of all Spirit-filled, I'm talking about Christians who theoretically believe in healing and the gifts of the Spirit. Three-quarters of those Christians do not believe that they can hear from God. And I suspect it's pretty widespread here too. They don't really believe. You hear expressions of doubt, you know, I don't really know that God doesn't just talk, He doesn't talk to me. Um, well, let me just suggest to you that this passage is about that, it's talking about that. And here James says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men generously. What's he saying? You need divine guidance. You need God to speak to you about a matter. You need wisdom from God. God gives to all people generously. Everybody say generously. generously. Yeah, so he's willing. He's willing and he's talking, okay? He gives it to everyone generously. And without reproach, what does that mean? It means he's not critical of you for asking. He's not critical of you for not knowing exactly what to do in a circumstance. He does not reproach you for wanting to know, for asking him. It will be given to him, but let him ask in faith without any doubting. The moment someone says, I just can't hear from God, guess what? They're not going to. They're disqualifying themselves. Let him ask without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. The picture here is instability. They're, dr they're driven and tossed by the wind. What does that mean? They're driven by circumstances. See, one of the things that we have talked about is many people 
trying to determine the will of God through their circumstances, through their experiences. And it's a very poor way to determine will of God because your lack of experience, is, your lack of experience with healing perhaps in a situation does not reveal that it's God's will for you not to be healed. Perhaps some of you did not experience the baptism in the spirit because you, because you had any knowledge of it. It was outside your realm of experience and you, were, you received it because you believed what God's word said and you received something outside the realm of your experience. See, that's the way it works. You can receive because of what Jesus has done. That's where you should determine what the truth is and not through the fact that you've experienced something you haven't experienced. Something. The one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. They're constantly moving around, never able to stabilize. There's only one place where there's stable, there's stability in, in this world, uh, in this age. And that's on Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is... That would make a good song. <laughs> but that's the truth. There's only one place of stability. There's only one way to qualify yourself is because of what Jesus has done. There's only one way to receive a healing. It's because of what Jesus has done. There's only one way to be saved. There's just because of what Jesus has done. There's only one way to get your, answer, your prayers answered in the name of Jesus. See? Well, there's only one place where someone can stand in stability because if we try to do it in our own righteousness, not happening. We try to do it out of our own experience, not happening. It's because of what Jesus has done is where stability remains. If we try to do it because of any other thing, any try to build on any other thing, it will not be stable in this world. And we will be what's described here. We'll be like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Nothing stable pushed around by circumstances of life, always trying to figure out what God wants because of circumstances. It just doesn't work. Let not that man expect that he'll receive anything of the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. You get the picture here in the area of healing. Jesus heals the sick, but maybe he won't heal me. Jesus heals the sick, but maybe I'm the special exception. Jesus heals the sick, but, 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 but. It's complexity happening. And instead of what we need to do is qualify ourselves on the basis of the cross. Jesus heals the sick, and I qualify because of what he's done. Jesus heals the sick, and he healed everyone in the multitude, therefore I qualify. Jesus healed the sick, and so the but no longer is any reason to disqualify ourselves. Instead, we add reasons to qualify ourselves. It comes by grace, and therefore I qualify. It's because God is good, and I qualify. He's showing me mercy and kindness, and I qualify. We put ourselves in that condition and we use our, our capacity to reason about things to change the way we approach this. Does that make sense? And we begin to say, I qualify not because of anything that I've done. I don't qualify because I'm a good person. I don't qualify because I'm smart. I don't qualify for any other reason other than what Jesus has done for me. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Shifting sand, whatever that is, I've forgotten. But in any case, let not that man expect that he'll receive anything of the Lord being a double-minded man and stable on his way. So, we got this, Jesus heals the sick, and I qualify. Instead, we capture these ideas that come at us. Uh, we don't accept the idea that we don't qualify for some other reason. We appraise things through the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15 says, He who is spiritual appraises all things. And he goes on to say, but we have the mind of Christ. So how do we appraise things? Well, we think about things in the way that Jesus would have thought about them. That's what the mind of Christ is. It's not some mystical thing. The disciples had the mind of Christ. Paul had the mind of Christ. He knew how, what Christ had taught. He knew what Christ had demonstrated to his disciples moment by moment, situation by situation. And therefore, he was able to appraise, evaluate the things that came along as whether or not they were the will of God or not. See, lots of times when people... Uh, get this, get, finally get this into their head that they can evaluate things based on what Jesus taught his disciples. Uh, it changes everything. I remember our friends Tom and Jody Chavan, uh, who have healing working very well. And uh, when I f first realized that they had really understood this, uh, they, we were having lunch together and they said something to me like, uh, Roger, you know, our pastor said thus and so. And you know what? We don't think that's what Jesus taught. 
we think that he actually taught this. They weren't saying it in a critical way. They just had learned to sort out things based on what Jesus taught his disciples. Because here's the, here's, here's the truth. What Jesus taught his disciples works. It works. Uh, all these other things that people add to this complicate things. Uh, I was in Toronto ministering in their school of ministry there, and a young man popped up, and he said, he said, Dr. Sapp, I, um, um, I'm very confused about healing. And he said, uh, we had a guy here last week. Uh, he mentioned his name, and I said, yes, I know this man. He says, well, he and, I, he and you don't agree on healing. I said, yeah, I know. <laughs> and uh, he says, but both of you get people healed. He said, uh, I don't really get this. And I said, well, there's more than one way to get to Toronto. He said, what? Um, I said, there's more than one way to get to Toronto. I said, I can get on a plane from Dallas and I can be here in three hours. And when I step off the plane and come to this meeting hall and step up into the pulpit, you can't tell how I got here. I'm here, I've arrived. I said, there's more than one way to get to a place of faith. I said, on the other hand, see, I could, if I know what, what time I'm supposed to be here, I can plan accordingly and I can get on my bicycle <laughs> and get on my bicycle and I'll eventually get here. I said, but it'll just take a lot of pedaling. And, uh, but when I stand up in the pulpit here, yeah, I'm arrived, I've gotten here. And you can't tell how I got here. There's one more than one way to get to a place of faith. If I believe that I have to cross every T, dot every I, jump every hurdle, I have to do all these things. I have to do these 15 steps before I get, uh, get, get to a place where I can get somebody healed. Then when I've done those 15 steps to my own satisfaction, my faith will work. However, if I don't do the 15 steps, then I probably won't have any faith. To, then I won't be able to pray for you in faith. I said, but... Here's the question. It says, if what, is what he's teaching the bicycle or the airplane? I said, because what I'm telling you is that the, the airplane is what Jesus taught his disciples. It's the most efficient way to get the job done. And if you add anything to that, then what happens is it complicates things and slows down the whole process. And yes, some people may receive healing because God is not validating our methodology. He's validating the good news. So if the good news gets there somehow or another, even if it's complex, it'll have its impact on people and people will respond to it. But I said, what you have to decide is, is he on the airplane, is he on the airplane or am I on the airplane? <laughs> or is he on the bicycle or am I on the bicycle? I said, I had truthfully, I've been on the bicycle. And I've got, I got there, I got a few people healed, but it took a lot of pedaling. I don't want to ever be on the bicycle again. I want to do what Jesus taught his disciples. Yes? Amen. All right. Near the top of page 14, first common doubt we're going to talk about. This is so common, we're going to talk about the major four doubts that people have, and some of them are pretty, actually we'll, I'll talk more about more than one thing in each doubt, but uh, first common doubt that people have is, it, is it God's will for me to be healed? This idea is appraised by the mind of Christ, by knowing Jesus Christ. Obviously, what did Jesus reveal of the Father's will? He healed everyone who came to him, never turned anyone away, never suggested that God had another reason for them remaining sick. Very important for us to see this. He healed everyone in the multitude several times. That's what the disciples would have seen. They would have known that the will of God was for everyone, good and the bad, to receive a healing. Um, I often have done that Jesus heals the good, the bad, and the ugly, and then have everyone turn to one, one another and say, which are you? <laughs> Didn't do that to you today. But uh, the bottom line is that Jesus wouldn't heal them because they were good. He was healing them because he was good. See? He moved with compassion and healed the sick, and he had compassion even for the bad folks. God truly really does love the world, even the bad people in the world. And therefore, you know, when someone stands in front of them, I have learned over the years not to judge them because God's not. So you can get a drug addict. I had a, had a uh, guy in San Diego walk up to me and show me his tracks. He said he was a heroin addict, HIV positive, would Jesus heal him? What are you going to say to this guy? In my previous framework of thinking about this, I would have thought, oh boy, 
uh, how are we going to help this guy? Uh, you know, we've got to get him to renounce the occult. We've got to, uh, we've got to get him to forgive everybody. We've got to, um, hmm, I've got to make sure he's fully repentant from his sins. Oh, how, you know, I would have, there would have been so much complexity in my thinking about it, I would not have been able to respond in a favorable way. I wouldn't have known what to say to him. Probably would have said something stupid. Instead, what I said to him, of course, Jesus is willing to heal you. Why is that? Because if he had been in the multitude 2,000 years ago, that's how Jesus would have responded to him. You know, Jesus wouldn't have given him a whole bunch of things. He had to go clean up your act, go, in, go into this program over here, you can get your act cleaned up, and then, then we'll minister to you. Aren't you glad that Jesus didn't do that? That means that you qualify right now, not after a whole bunch of preparation. You qualify right now to receive something from God. Hallelujah. Second common doubt, sickness has a godly purpose. The devil is really clever at creating these purposes, and most of these ideas came from the medieval period. During the medieval period, people thought that somehow or another being injured, injuring themselves was very spiritual. They whipped themselves, they crawled up uh, you know, long flights of stairs uh, so their knees would be bloody and in pain, all being trying to be very spiritual. In fact, they said that Luther had done that, and somewhere kind of halfway up when he had very bloody knees and he was in a lot of pain, he, he asked himself, is this really doing me any good? <laughs> And I think he came to the conclusion, no, it wasn't, he wasn't becoming more spiritual by having pain in his knees, climbing a, climbing a set of stairs. But those, these ideas were very present in the church during the medieval period where people actually physically harmed themselves to be spiritual. You know, laid on beds of nails to harm themselves, to be uncomfortable, wore hair shirts to irritate themselves purposely, somehow thinking that this would make them more spiritual. These ideas now have been modified, but they're still present with us uh, in the churches that, that somehow or another having cancer is going to make you a better person. You know, all these ideas are still very, very present. Uh, second common doubt, sickness has a godly purpose. This doubt is produced when a divine purpose is assigned to sickness. It's so common to be a cultural norm in the church. It's throughout the Western church you run into these ideas. Well, you've got to spiritually appraise them based on the mind of Christ. List of common purposes. God may be using this sickness in my life to, probably the most common idea, to teach me something. Okay. Now, the New Testament doesn't say that sickness is a teacher. And Jesus um, didn't reveal that it was a teacher. In fact, every time he encountered someone who was sick, what did he do? He untaught them. He healed them. Whatever that was happening with them, if God was teaching them, Jesus interfered with it. You see that? He healed them all when they came. So obviously that was not what was happening. But let's just consider the idea that God's using sickness to teach us. All right, uh, first of all, first thing you ought to do when somebody brings this idea up to them, ask them how long they've been sick. I've heard 15 years, on a couple occasions, somewhere in that realm. Then I say to them, okay, all right, 15 years. I said, boy, what have you learned? It's a obvious question. If God is teaching them for 15 years, they ought to be able to tell us something profound that God has taught them in that 15 years. Most people, when you say that to them, they'll draw a blank. They won't know what to tell you because God is not teaching them something. They haven't got it. If, obviously, if they had the lesson, they wouldn't still be sick, right? That's the idea. They would learn the lesson and they wouldn't be sick anymore. Well, they haven't learned the lesson in 15 years. It's not a very good teaching method. <laughs> and it's just misunderstanding because God is not using it. He's given us his spirit to teach us. That's what the New Testament says. The spirit of God has been given to us. But the medieval period got that confused. And so how they assigned the, the value systems, the the, the, the truth about the Holy Spirit got assigned to sickness. That God was somehow trying to teach us through sickness. I was never, I don't think I ever learned anything by being sick other than the fact that I didn't want to be sick. Jesus did not hesitate to heal because of some unlearned lesson in someone's life. Aren't you glad that that's true? He's trying to improve my character. 
people don't really become more Christ-like by being sick. What you do see uh, in a godly person is that sickness will tend to strip away the capacity to hide what they are. And so if a person is godly, they will show their godliness in sickness. Uh, if they're not so godly, what you'll see is bitterness and, you know, what you'll see, the, the, what they really are is stripped away too. I mean, you'll be able to see that as well. Um, people don't tend to become better through sickness. What the, you, see, you just get to see what they really are sometimes over a period of sickness. Um, I don't believe I was ever nicer when I was sick, to be honest with you. Jesus never indicated that he wouldn't heal someone because of God working in their character. Aren't you glad that that's true? You know, we, we do not actually see Jesus in any way implying that sickness was somehow making someone a better person. He treated sickness like it was an enemy every time he encountered it. Remember the first thing he said when he commissioned his disciples was heal the sick. He didn't say heal the sick, but God really doing a deep work in some of them. God is not doing a deep work. In fact, sickness in the old covenant is considered a curse, not a blessing. Nowhere do we see that God is supposed to be using sickness in that kind of way. Long-term sickness tends to reveal what we are, but it does not tend to improve our character. The disciples simply would have known, not known the idea from Jesus that sickness somehow was improving somebody's character. God is using this in my life to test me. Now, this is an important one because occasionally you run into people who think that somehow or another there's some sort of test happening and that they've got to quit using their medication. Let me illustrate this with a story. I was ministering out in one of the uh, western states in the United States, and uh, we had an experience where one of the ladies uh, responded to the gospel, asked prayer for prayer during one of the services for her eyes. She had very bad eyes, wearing, wearing very thick glasses, and she did receive a, really a wonderful healing of her eyes. She was able to see without her glasses. She was demonstrating to everyone that she could read things before. Before, apparently, she could only see a few feet in front of her and there even unclearly. And uh, so she received a major healing of her eyes and even went back and got some verification of what had happened. Uh, in any case, uh, she comes with this story to some of the other services, a testimony of what had happened to her. It inspired another group of people to also receive healing of their eyes. That happens quite a bit, by the way. Some, a key, what we call a key healing will happen in a group of believers and it'll inspire everyone else to receive healing. We've seen that happen a number of times. In fact, I told you the story of Elaine. I think I did that last night. Elaine getting her healing. Uh, there was actually, that service went on for a number of hours after Elaine's healing because everyone was inspired by the healing. And we had, I don't know, maybe another hundred people got healed of things in that service. It went on for hours after that. And people were healed of uh, deafness, uh, a chronic pain, a variety of things that actually had not happened in the earlier service, uh, but because they'd seen this healing happening that inspired them, they received their healing, believing that Jesus was doing those things. Um, in any case, uh, I was there ministering, and um, the pastor uh, called me about two weeks after this meeting was over with, and he says, Roger, you've got to be really clear that, uh, that there's no test happening. I said, well, I don't teach there's a test. And he says, yeah, but people are confused about this. He said, you remember that we had about a half a dozen people receive healing of their eyes? I said, yeah. Yeah, that was really very good. And he said, well, they testified the next Sunday morning to everyone in our church, even the people who had not come to the meetings heard this testimony. And he said, well, it inspired a lot of people to take off their glasses and to begin to believe God that they were going to pass the test of, uh, of healing and show God that they had faith and uh, receive healing of their eyes. And I said, ooh, that's problematic. He says, you, don't, you're, you really don't know the half of it, brother. He said, uh, our parking lot has gotten very dangerous. <laughs> he says, we got people that can't see very far that are driving their cars thinking that they're gonna pass this test. And I said, well, I, you know, of course, what had happened is the first group of people had heard the gospel. They had believed it to be true. They had taken off their glasses just long enough, I mean, to get prayer for their eyes, where people could lay their hands on their eyes. They had received a healing. And the other people, on the other hand, had not heard the gospel, did not have an opportunity to believe that it was true. Instead, they substituted the idea that they had to pass a test. So they took off their glasses thinking they were going to prove to God that they had faith. 
What does faith do? It comes to Jesus for help. They weren't coming to Jesus for help, and so they didn't receive anything. And eventually, I suspect that most of them, if not all, put their glasses back on, thinking, well, it's not God's will or something. They didn't receive it in the same sort of way. Now, the implications of this are pretty, pretty important. There's no test happening. Turn to somebody and say, there's no test. There's no test. There's no test you have to pass. The only, if there is a test, it's simply coming to Jesus for help. That's the test, okay? Coming to him for help. Because if you think there's a test, then you might do something foolish. And occasionally we run into someone who thinks that they have to quit using their medication in order to receive a healing. And in some cases, this life-threatening kind of thing that they're doing. You know, someone perhaps who has diabetes that thinks that somehow or another they have to prove to God that they have faith by quit using their medication before they receive healing. Here's the, here's the question. When should you quit using your medication? The answer is when you need it no more. There is no test. God is not withholding healing from those who are using medication. There's no test happening. And therefore, you can use medication right up to the point of your healing. Who makes that decision? Do not ask me to help you with that decision. If you don't need it anymore, then go back to your doctor and get him to verify that you don't need it anymore. Don't be foolish. Okay, now, saying all that, I don't know what your culture deals with, but in the American culture, we are, our insurance industry fouls up this thing and makes it more complex because it insures doctors against malpractice. Uh, somebody can sue them and they, they could go bankrupt and lose their practice and basically if they're sued because of making some sort of medical error. So the insurance basically forces them to keep you on the same treatment plan despite the fact that you may not need it anymore. So this is, a, this, if you find yourself, I don't know if you're, I'm sure your system works differently, but if you find yourself in a situation where you really believe you're healed, but your doctor's not really agreeing with that, can you seek a second opinion? You know, because you're, you know, the new doctor is able to make a new diagnosis and so on. I don't know if you're facing, you face some of the same sort of things, but we've seen people completely healed of cancer, had no cancer symptoms. Even their doctors saying, you know, really don't seem to have active cancer now, but they still want them to do chemo. And, uh, and then get sick from the chemo. We've seen them do that because our, their insurance requires them to keep them on the same treatment program. So I don't know you had the same circumstance, but if there's a similar circumstance where a doctor may be reluctant to agree with you, then I recommend that you do seek a second opinion. But the bottom line is that you don't have to quit using your medication in order to receive a healing. That makes sense? Okay. God is using this in my life to judge me or discipline me for sin. Well, this is a kind of an abusive idea about God. Um, one of the things that, you know, you ask, if, if we being evil know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more the Heavenly Father give good gifts to them? And I ask that particular principle, we have to ask the question, would you cause your son to teach him a lesson to have a stroke? If you did, what would you be? You would be an abuser, right? If you wanted to teach uh, one of your children a lesson and you caused them to have uh, a physical injury for a long, long time, great pain, difficulty, and so on, what would you be? You would be an abuser. And there are better ways to teach people things and that sort of thing. And so sometimes we even, our theology has allowed us to even con consider God to be a good abuser in some sort of way. <laughs> But here's the bottom line is that what we have seen over the years is that the devil gives purpose to sickness. So he will tell people quite often you're being punished because of your sins and it sticks to them because they feel guilty over their sins. And see, what does sin, the sense of guilt make happen to you? It makes you want to be punished. So this sticks. In other words, the devil makes an accusation against God. God is judging you because of what you've done. And so it sticks. Uh, occasionally ran into this. I think I told you the story about Elaine, who that's what I dealt with in Elaine, helping her to see that God had forgiven her her sins. And as a result of that forgiveness, she was able to receive a healing. This is a very common problem with Christians, feeling guilty over some matter out of the past and not really believing that they're forgiven. 
the Bible says that when we confess our sins, He forgives us our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. What does that mean? You confess the sins that you're aware of sincerely to God. You confess the sins that you're aware of. Repent of them. Turn away. Repent of them. Just want to do the right thing. That's what we're talking about here. Then God forgives you all the sins, even the ones you're not aware of. He declares you righteous. See, this is very important stuff. You are declared righteous by God even if you are a rascal. <laughs> I know that to be true. That true, T.D.? That's right. He declares rascals righteous. Righteous on the basis of what Jesus has done. It's called justification. We are justified, made righteous because of what Jesus done. It comes to us as a gift. It's not based on our performance. It's based on what Jesus has done. Therefore, you are only one breath away from being totally forgiven at any given moment if you're not walking in it right now. One breath away. It's that simple. We just have to believe that it's true. God is very generous with his wisdom. We saw that. He's very generous with his forgiveness. He's the most forgiving person in the universe. Come on. You believe that? It's all because of Jesus. Jesus has borne the wrath of God. And therefore, as a result of what Jesus has done, you and I can receive grace and really live a new life in Christ. This is a, this is a problem of Christians. Oftentimes, you even run into it in ministers. Ministers of the, ministers of the gospel, you know, you don't enter the ministry without having a sense of a high calling. You know, that God's called you to something, uh, you know, that you, that's larger than yourself. And you know that you can't accomplish it without his help. And most people, most ministers that I know, they live with a sense of inadequacy, of incompletion. That they have not fully fulfilled their call. They live with that. And when their relationships are problematic, you know, if they, people who are in the ministry see people come and go in their, in their lives. And sometimes they don't know why they go. Uh, they know, you may know that there's a problem, but you don't know what the problem was. And so people don't always level with you, so you live with a sense of incompleteness. So many times you see ministers of the gospel who really preach forgiveness but seem to not live in it. They feel guilty because of this sense of high calling. So you end up sometimes ministering, guys. I was at a meeting in Virginia, and uh, a man who had had a, had a stroke had, uh, came forward in response. He turns out to be a minister of the gospel. And uh, his right side was wilted, his right arm was dysfunctional, right leg was dysfunctional. And uh, he, um, when I laid hands on him and prayed for him the first time, not much is happening. Uh, we had seen people healed already, a couple people out of wheelchairs earlier in the meeting. I actually have that on videotape. Uh, and unfortunately the sound didn't come out, so it's not worth publishing, but it's kind of fun to watch, see people, we're praying for people and all of a sudden they're out of a wheelchair. But in any case, the... Uh, in any case, that had happened. So he had gotten inspired to come, come forward. I laid hands on him and nothing's happening. And so I said to him, tell me why you think that you're not receiving healing. Now, I want you to understand how I said it. I did not say to him, tell me why God's not healing you. I don't believe that's the problem. Because I believe it's done in Christ. God is willing. Tell me why you're not receiving healing. And he immediately blurted out uh, that he had committed serious sins. And he was really telling me that God had judged him, that the, the stroke was, a, was God's judgment. Now, you can argue with people about their perceptions of things, or you can help them towards forgiveness. It's easier to actually help them towards forgiveness. So I said to him, sir, um, uh, God forgives your sins and remembers them no more. Have you turned away from these things? He said, yes. I said, but you still feel guilty? Yes. I said, I said forgiveness is real. He, and he looked at me, kind of puzzled. And, and uh, I suspected he had preached forgiveness. Didn't, he just didn't realize he needed to receive it himself. <laughs> In any case, it's pretty common for people to do that, by the way. In any case, uh, he, um, I did this little technique that I told you when I talked to, told you the story with Elaine. It was another person where I actually had them see themselves standing before the throne of God, dressed in white linen. Uh, just as soon as he had done that, he, uh, um, he started being able to move his right arm after I got him to do the prayer again. 
and pretty soon he was moving his right leg and all the effects of the stroke completely disappeared. You know, getting people healed of strokes is, if you have an opportunity, uh, typically it's not too hard. Uh, it's no harder than anything else. Um, uh, you don't always, I don't always see everything I want to see, but, uh, but the bottom line is that Father is willing to do these things. And sometimes Christians have trouble coming to God because of these issues of, over forgiveness. Can you just turn to somebody and say, God really will forgive you? And if he's forgiven you, then you cannot, you cannot maintain the idea that he's still punishing you. My children, you know, when they, were, when they were sorry, that was enough. I didn't punish them any further than that. You know, that's what I was looking for. I was looking for repentance. I was looking for them a changed attitude. Continue to punish them after that really is abuse. You know, and I, when I saw that attitude, um, if it didn't come readily, then it went on for a little while, but, uh, but it mostly came readily. And uh, the bottom line is that if God has forgiven us, how can he be punishing us? You see that? Come on. And so the idea that God is, is going to maintain some sort of punishment in someone's life uh, after he's forgiven them, it really doesn't work. Um, I can't, I can't uh, forgive people and still hold a grudge or still be mad at them or do anything like that as well. God's trying to slow me down with this sickness. What a dumb idea this one is. <laughs> but you hear, you hear people express, oh, I got sick because I really needed to slow down. Well, maybe that's true, but God did not make you sick. Maybe you needed to slow down. Maybe you... You know, that uh, from that perspective. But let me just remind you that sickness is not a good way to rest. You know, I believe that the Holy Spirit said to me, take a Hawaiian vacation. I think I'd respond favorably to that. <laughs> Go on holiday to, to Spain. I think I'd respond favorably to that. Um, and the idea that people can't respond favorably to that, you know, that they just work too hard and so on, that's really kind of a dumb idea that God somehow would make them sick so they would slow down. No, 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 no. You can hear the Lord, and he can get through to you. And he, uh, if you qualify yourself for divine guidance, what will God do for you? He'll speak to you. He'll guide you. He'll speak to you in dreams and tell you that real important for you to take that holiday. He will, he will help you. He will help you steward your health. And the Lord really wants the best for you. And he wants you to live an abundant life. And that means that he is not in the business of trying to beat you up to get you to do the right things. That is not the way God handles this. Um, he just, I don't know about you, but he woos me. I, you know, I pay attention to that. And if something, if I'm not listening, uh, God has better ways to get my attention than making me sick. And he does. He knows how to get my attention. <laughs> A divine and benevolent mystery. Christ does not reveal that God wishes someone to remain sick due to a mystery. The disciples would have known that those who came in simple faith to Jesus were always healed, and those who didn't come didn't receive healing. God is glorified in sickness. Another idea, actually what you see in the scriptures is God is glorified in healing of that sickness, not actually the sickness itself. That's some of the confusion that exists out there. Near the top of page 16, we see occasionally we see people expressing wrong ideas about Job. Uh, let me sum it up for you. Job um, lived to be 160 years old. If we consider nearly every Bible commentator that I've ever read says that Job's sickness was less than a year, you can't even maintain that if you carefully study the book of Job. His friends come, uh, his friends come sit with him for a week after he's sick. They say nothing during that week, and then a conversation begins, and the conversation has no breaks in it. It doesn't say they stop for dinner, tea. I guess it would be tea here. They didn't stop for tea. They didn't, uh, they didn't uh, have a coffee break. Uh, they didn't run out of, you know, the sun did not go down, and tells them they started the next day with a conversation. In fact, the entire book of Job can be read in one sitting in an afternoon, and there's no breaks in the conversation. So it really can't get from just actually the book of Job much more than a week out of it. So how long was Job sick? Well, traditionally people think he was sick a long time, but even the Bible commentators say less than a year. 
And that's only one, less than 1% 1 of his lifetime. He lived to be 140 years old. So the idea that Job was sick a long, long time and just couldn't get healed is not found in the book of Job. In fact, most people who bring up Job to you, they don't know that God healed him. He was healed. So if you want to sum up the book of Job, what you get is the devil made him sick, God healed him. But people sometimes will complicate this very simple truth by basically saying, uh, giving uh, the idea that somehow God wanted Job to remain sick. And the idea goes like this. What God allowed, God allowed Job to remain sick, so God must have wanted him to be sick. Now, that particular idea doesn't work very well in many other things. For instance, let's apply that idea. God allows people to be unsaved. He must want people to be unsaved. You buy that? God allows people to go to hell. God must want people to go to hell. Do you believe that? God allows abuse of children in this country and throughout the world. God, what well, God allows, he must want. Do you believe that? God allows marriages to break up. He must want marriages to break up. Do you believe that? No, what we find is that uh, this particular idea does not work when we apply it to other things. So why does it work in Job? It doesn't work in Job. What God allows doesn't mean he wants these things. How do Christians determine the will of God? Well, we started out by talking that the will of God is determined through Jesus Christ, that he shows us the will of the Father. We determine the will of God as Christians by the light of Jesus Christ. He is the light of the world. We don't determine it by the darkness that God is allowing in the world. We don't determine it by unregenerate humanity. We don't re we determine what God's will is by the fact that people have not received what Jesus has done. We don't determine it by the fact that, that there are fallen angels at work and demonic activity. We don't determine the will of God by the, by the darkness. We determine it by the light of Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? See? So what God is allowing is really has no bearing on what his will is. What we have determined the will of God is through what Jesus does. And the bottom line is that that God did heal Job. So you're not having a Job's experience until you get healed. Seriously, you don't qualify for calling yourself your experience and a Job's experience until you receive healing. And then God restored everything to Job, more than everything, greatly blessed. So if you're gonna have a Job's experience, you better be sure to get everything restored and a lot more. How's that? <laughs> say, turn to somebody and say, you don't qualify for a Job's experience. All right, how about Paul's thorn in the flesh? The idea that God has a purpose for his remaining sick, Job's, uh, Paul's thorn in the flesh comes up in the subject, as a subject. The idea that people believe that Paul's thorn in the flesh was sickness. Now, there are really good reasons, theologically, biblically, from the Greek language, is not to accept that idea. First of all, the passage itself tells us that this was happening to Job because he had surpassing revelations. So you don't qualify for a thorn to start with unless you're having surpassing revelations. You've been to the third heavens this week. How about you? Anybody been there but me? Been to the third heavens this week? <laughs> nope. So you're not having surpassing revelations and most people that would claim to have a thorn in the flesh are not having them either. So you don't qualify from that perspective. The second thing is, is that it does tell us what the thorn is. It's obscured a little bit by translation. The translators have chosen in English versions to, to uh, translate the Greek word angelos. What does that sound like to you? It is. It's actually the same Greek word, angel. Uh, translators sometimes will translate or they will transliterate. A transliterated word is a, is a Greek word that's made into an English word like, uh, like baptism. Baptism is Greek word baptizo, and so it's translated into baptism. Uh, in fact, J John the Baptist, if we would literally translate John the Baptist, it would be John the Dipper. It doesn't sound very religious, does it? <laughs> That's what baptize means. It means to dip. So he would be John the Dipper if we translate it. But instead we transliterate and it's John the Baptist. It sounds very religious when we do that. Well, this particular Greek word, angelos, is normally translated, excuse me, transliterated as the word angel. In other words, it's created, an English word is created 
that takes its place. Everywhere else in the Bible, it is, 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 you'll see angel. And here, the translators have chosen to obscure that fact by using the word messenger. But it's actually angel. So what does Paul say? He says, a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, an angel of Satan is what it says literally. So what does he say in the thorn in the flesh is? A fallen angel. And what did this fallen angel do? It buffeted him. What does that mean? It buffeted him. And he asked the Lord to remove this three times. And the Lord said, in so many words, I mean, if you really kind of look at the whole context, in so many words, the Lord says, no, you get to experience what I did. And this is not going to harm you. It's actually going to help you. In fact, some of the same Greek words are used in the next chapter where it talks about Jesus was crucified because of weakness, but lives because of the power of God. Same kinds of ideas present. So what is Paul talking about here? He was having trouble everywhere he went. He was being persecuted. Difficulties were coming because he had a surpassing revelation of God's glory and was preaching it. The devil was opposing him, stirring up problems against him everywhere he went. And that's what his thorn in the flesh was. That's what he was asking to be removed. There's no evidence that Paul had any trouble receiving healing. In fact, in several places he mentions the fact that he was sick, but he received a healing. And so there's, there's no idea. That, see, the idea is that sometimes if Paul couldn't receive a healing, then God must not want him, everybody to be well. But that's really not accurate. Uh, if you want more detail, perhaps you are somebody who studies the scripture and perhaps in the original language and so on. I do go in some detail in my book about what the original languages say about this so that you can get it. By the way, the word thorn appears, does not appear in any other New Testament passage, but it does appear in the Greek Old Testament. And in the Greek Old Testament, three is, is used three times, and two of the three times are clearly talking about enemies and not sickness. The third time doesn't, it's pretty neutral, it doesn't talk about sickness either. It said there will be a thorn in your side, talking about the enemies of Israel. So this idea of thorn really is, has to do with enemies rather than it has to do with sickness. Moving right along here. Third common doubt, maybe it's not God's timing for you to be healed. Well, this fits with the medieval view. See, what happens is, is that the medieval view says this. It says God has a purpose for you being sick. Therefore, when you've, he's done with that, he's taught you your lesson or punished you or whatever it may be that's happening, then the timing will come for your healing. His will will change and you will receive healing. That's the medieval view. But if God is, doesn't have a purpose and it's always his will to receive healing, when is the timing to be healed? Now. When you're sick, when else could it be? When you have the need is when you can receive. When, does it, when do you have the need to receive forgiveness? When you've committed sin. When do you need to be healed? When you're sick. So when possibly could it be? It's right now. Today is the day of salvation. Same Greek word for healing in some places. The day is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. We receive it uh, when we need it. And therefore, the, the timing is in our hands. The multitudes that came to Jesus, he wasn't determining the timing for their healing. They were. They made the decision to come. The woman with the issue of blood, he didn't determine the timing of her healing. He didn't even know she was there. She determined the timing of her healing when she came. The two lepers, or the ten lepers, rather. The ten lepers, they determined the timing of their healing by coming to Jesus. See, what we see in the New Testament, that God doesn't have a timing for your healing. Actually, he did 2,000 years ago at the cross. But now you determine it by you receiving it. And so uh, it may work itself out, especially in certain times. But those times are determined by you. Who determined the time of your salvation? Actually, you did. You made a decision to receive Christ. You could have postponed it. Many people do. They postpone. No, I'm not ready to do this. See, they're making a determination of when the time of their salvation is going to be. Jesus preached, the kingdom is at hand. He's, what is he saying? It's happening now. And proved it by healing the sick. Well, he's saying the kingdom is present. You can receive this, this gift from God because the kingdom is present. Fourth common doubt. Maybe I lack faith to be healed. Now, this one kind of makes sense from some perspective. See, um, but it's really not true. Um, say if, 
if God's not the problem, and I've already discussed with you that he's really not the problem, you know, that we're the problem, okay, um, then the issue of faith would happen. However, the New Testament gives us encouragement about this whole idea about faith. Faith is a fruit of the Spirit. It's a gift of the Spirit. Everyone is given a measure of faith uh, that must rest on Jesus. Um, we all use faith all the time. You came in here into uh, this room and you sat yourself right down on those, those chairs and you didn't check to see if the chairs would hold you up. Why is that? You have chair faith. You believe in chairs. You have a good experience of chairs. You believe them to be reliable. And unless you, you know, end up on, on your can somehow or another, uh, you will not actually check. It's not an, you don't go through an intellectual experience with chairs on most occasions. You just sit down, trusting that they will support you. Well, you can kind of come to that place in the area of healing, that basically you trust Jesus that you can rely upon him that he is exactly who the scripture says he is, that you can come boldly to the throne of grace and receive mercy and help in time of need. And you can get to the place where healing comes to you pretty readily and pretty easily. I, I, think I, I don't think I've told you guys how I received healing from cancer. Um, <clears throat> I had the Lord speak to me about putting uh, meditations, healing meditations on playing cards. Now at the time, I resisted a little bit and I said something to the Lord about, uh, I don't know if you know God has a sense of humor, but he does. I said, I could tell you, actually tell you some very funny stories of uh, practical good jokes that the Lord has pulled on me. He, uh, he, God has a real sense of humor. In fact, if you don't believe that, just look in the mirror. But uh, <laughs> I, I laugh every time I look. <laughs> uh, in any case, uh, so uh, I, uh, the Lord said to me, and he doesn't talk to me this, this way very often. He says, I want you to put playing, you know, verses of scripture, healing scriptures on playing cards. I want you to, people to meditate using cards to do that on the various, various things. And I, I said, uh, well, Lord, you know, some people are not going to like that because uh, they're not going to like the idea of playing cards and, you know, gambling and that sort of thing, mixing with scripture. And, they, and the Lord said to me, uh, he said, um, you know, why do you care what they think? They don't like you anyway. <laughs> I said, oh, that's true, Lord. <laughs> so what I did was I did, I did what the Lord said, and I sent them off to be printed in another country, and, and eventually they, they came back, and it happened to be the same week that I was diagnosed with cancer myself, uh, which was a real shock. And I, wasn't, I didn't feel sick. I, kind of My diagnosis happened because I went to the doctor, basically, and said I just didn't have a lot of energy complain about a lack of energy. I didn't feel sick, I didn't, wasn't depressed, didn't have any kind of other symptoms. And they did a number of testing on me and found that I had cancer. Uh, and so it was a rather, a rather a shock, but I already believed in meditating on the scripture. I believe in meditating on Jesus Christ. So what I did was I took those cards out and I was the first one to use them. And I played solitaire twice every morning. And uh, it went for about an hour. I prayed very slowly. I had a cup of coffee in front of me and I, I laid out these cards. And as I played each card, I would confess the card and confess my healing and look to Jesus you know, inwardly. Now I laid out these cards, so these were not unusual concepts for me. I mean, I, I had uh, you know, thought that these were helpful concepts. So I, but I did those every morning for a month. And then twice during that month, I asked for public prayer. I told people that, that I was facing cancer and the prognosis was not good, and uh, was, uh, you know, it was a shock to me, but I believe Jesus was healing me. Well, the bottom line is that within a month of that time, my numbers went to zero, I mean below zero. Uh, my doctors, both, both of them, said, you, you just can't possibly have active cancer with those numbers that you're showing right now. My numbers were pretty high when they first tested me, and they found the cancer in a biopsy. So, uh, but the bottom line is that uh, they're telling me now I'm free from cancer, so hallelujah. Amen. Now, now that, see, I've seen many times people are looking for an event that declares their healing. I'm just looking for Jesus as my healer. That's all I was doing. Just renewing my faith in him as my healer, just focusing. I don't know when I got healed during that month. I just know that Jesus is my healer. You understand the difference between looking for an event and looking for Jesus, trying to find Jesus in this mix of things? See it. 
I think you can get healed if you look for, Je if you find Jesus, if Jesus finds you in this circumstance, if you react, if you interact with him, see him as your healer, come to him in that kind of way. And it may turn out to be a very dramatic event. However, many people get healed with no dra drama whatsoever. I had no drama, no drama in my healing whatsoever. I just got healed. Many times we've seen it that way. Uh, that's a good healing. A less dramatic healing is a real healing. <laughs> <laughs> Moving through this a little further here, maybe you lack faith to be healed. No, I don't really think that's a problem. In fact, you have faith, you use faith all the time, but I do believe that sometimes doubt is a problem. It's a doubt, uh, we, we, we don't qualify ourselves because of habit pattern. We've developed habit patterns of not doing this. So once you realize that you do qualify for healing, then what you begin to do is you begin to capture those thoughts that come at you that say you don't qualify or that you're unworthy or that somehow or another God's withholding something from you. You begin to see this thing the way that it really is and change your thinking about it and then you can receive what Jesus has done. If I can receive, you really can. I am no more righteous than you are. Um, I, I believe that uh, Jesus heals me not because I'm a good person but because he is. And that makes a huge amount of difference. Biblical facts about curses, I just want to mention a few of these things to you. I do have a book on the subject, and I can really take up the whole session talking about curses. But first of all, um, this is not a very old teaching, the breaking curses teaching. Uh, I remember when it wasn't being taught in the church. It's only been taught since about the 80s, somewhere in the mid-80s. I think Derek Prince started teaching, and as far as I can tell, he was the first one that was doing it. And uh, it spread around like wildfire around the world. Uh, he was a very popular teacher, and, and much of what he had to say was it was very good. And, uh, but this particular thing caught on like wildfire. But you know, the problem is from a Christ-centered standpoint, there's not a single example of Jesus breaking a curse. It's just not in the Bible. There are curses, but there's not a single example of Jesus doing this in ministry. Not only will you not find it in Jesus' ministry, you won't find it in the book of Acts or any place else. In fact, you can't find anyone from Genesis to Revelation breaking curses. And uh, it's, I think it's a superstition. I think it's a legalism built on lots of ideas pulled out of different things, but you will not find anyone doing this. It is a bogus solution for a bogus problem. We don't have problems with curses. If anything, the Old Testament tells us this, that that which God has blessed cannot be successfully cursed. That's the story of Balaam. The story of Balaam, Balaam attempts to curse Israel and is unable to do it. That which God has blessed cannot be successfully cursed. And the idea that somehow or another there's a lingering, lingering curse over people from generations past, that contradicts a lot of things that we know about the New Covenant. The New Covenant, God remembers our sins no more. True? New Covenant, he remembers our sins no more. But at the same time, this curse's teaching tells us that he's going to remember the sins of our forefathers. And they're going to be affecting us. Does that make any sense? Okay. Forgiven us our sins, but somehow or another there's a lingering effect out of the past generational curses. That makes no sense. In fact, God himself in the Old Testament contradicts this idea says it to through two prophets. He says, you are saying that the fathers eat sour grapes, but the children's teeth are set on edge. And God says in two places, I am not doing this. It's not happening. Look, look it up for yourself. He tries to correct that idea in the Old Testament, but some people have brought it back to the New Testament and telling us that we have to deal with generational curses. Where does Jesus teach this? Just not in the Bible. Anyway, you, you examine that. If you want to talk with me in more detail, I'd be glad to even talk to you through, through Skype. Or we have, actually have a website that we use. I'll be glad to discuss those details with you about that. But this is not a biblical teaching, and it creates a huge amount of problems in people's lives. People who get, get involved in this spend their wheels for years trying to, uh, trying to break curses that are non-existent thinking, interpreting everything that happens in their life through curses. Tell you one story, then we'll move on. Um, there's a church in our area that does a lot of this. It's a, a deliverance church. And I'm, by the way, I believe in deliverance. I believe in casting out demons. It's a deliverance church. And, uh, but they're very much involved in casting, uh, breaking curses. And they're also very paranoid about witches. 
And uh, in any case, uh, one day I drove by there, and the uh, pastor and I are friends, so I stop and sometimes and we go out to lunch. And so one of those occasions, he started talking to me about a coven of witches that had moved in across the street from the church and was attributing a number of the church's problems to this coven of witches. And I uh, can't argue with him because I don't really know what's going on, you know, but he's very concerned about this. Three months later, happened to be in the same area, stopped, say hello to him. Things have gotten worse. Um, the, this coven of witches is now sending spells against the church, curses, all, all variety of things. Everything, he, he believes that a lot of the stuff, the bad stuff that's happening in the church and in people's lives is a result of this coven of witches. This goes on for two years, and I'm by every three or four months to visit with him, and it just gets worse and worse and worse. And in fact, they get more specifics about uh, what's actually happening. They have names of spirits. They know what the, they feel like they know what uh, the, the, witch, uh, the witches are doing specifically. They got words of knowledge and revelations about this thing. They're having special meetings where they're breaking curses over the church. Uh, they're doing it before service, sometimes after service, feeling that they're involved in spiritual warfare every time they meet. Uh, and in any case, um, one day I went by there after two years and he's not there, but his assistant is there. And so I said, tell me what's going on with this coven of witches. And, you know, I've heard a lot about them over the last couple of years. And he says, oh, Roger, we're, uh, we're a little embarrassed about this. So come into my office. I'm going to close the door. I came into my office. I went in there and closed the door. He says, well, that coven of witches turned out to be a house church meeting across the street. Do you hear that? It was a church. It was a group of Christians meeting across the street. And they attributed everything bad. In fact, they would still be breaking curses, non-existent curses, except for the, the, they, that, that group of Christians decided some, one Sunday that they would be friendly and they would meet, they would actually go to church over there to introduce themselves. They were running and no one was pursuing. They, were, they spent a huge amount of energy, steam, what we call steam-heated imaginations imagining all these things coming against them. And when people have been exposed to this curses teaching, they are fear prone. Unknown people in unknown places speaking unknown words about them, affecting them. And the truth is, is that here's the truth. The devil himself and all his servants cannot undo what Jesus has done for you. No matter what they say, what they do, they cannot undo what Jesus has done for you. It's deeper than the deepest ocean. It's higher than the highest mountain. It cannot be undone by the words of a wicked person. But it can be, become ineffective in your life if you accept unbelieving ideas, fearful ideas, this you know, ideas that disqualify you for the grace of God. And I, the idea that a witch could undo what God has done for you in Christ is a disqualifying idea. I used to go on the websites and so on before the internet was real popular, go on prodigies websites, the news groups and various different things and challenge witches. I'm a nicer person now. But uh, I challenge witches to do their worst against me, telling them what the Bible had to say. I said, do your worst. And I, I would mock them. I'm, I'm nicer to witches these days. I would mock them, and they couldn't do a thing because I would not interpret anything that they did. And, you know, I mean, I just didn't see it happening. But if I was afraid, then I would interpret everything that happened as the work of witchcraft. And that's what happens when people get involved in these kinds of teachings. They start interpreting everything as the work of witches against them. And it's not happening. I promise you, what Jesus has done is greater than witchcraft. Yes? yes. All right. Okay. Maintaining or completing a healing, the right road leads to the right destination. We, uh, in our experience, the majority of the people can receive their healing without too much difficulty. Uh, the majority of people at least, at least get a good start, you know, we, when we pray with them. And, but there are a few that seem to have to hang in there. And I want to remind you that the tendency, if I say that there's a few that seem to have to hang in there, that the tendency is for people to put themselves in that category. But the truth is, is that you shouldn't. 
you know, you should. This is, this is a, minor, a, a minority experience to have to really seek the Lord over a period of time to receive your healing. Persistence does work to receive, and it also works to finish a healing. Everybody say persistence. Now, it's persistence in the right kinds of ways. Back a few years ago, um, met, a lady, uh, met a lady, I don't think Deanie minds me telling this story. Her name is Deanie Fricks. And Deanie functions in ministry with us today. She has healing working very well. But when I first met her, she had cancer. She had a number of things on her list, and uh, including uh, she had uh, uh, gotten um, a shingle in her eye. She had shingles all over, and she had one in her eye. The doctor told her she was going to lose the eye. Well, when I met her, she heard the good news. She believed it to be true, and she got prayer. And uh, within an hour, her eye was normal, which was very exciting to her. Uh, she felt that, uh, you know, what she could tell, that, that uh, most of her list, which were 10 items, uh, had gotten taken care of. Uh, but, and she was assuming that the cancer was taken care of as well. Well, she called me a month later and said, uh, Roger, what did I do wrong? The tendency is to see the cup half empty, rather than half full, that's the tendency that we have to think in terms of doing something wrong rather than doing something right. And I said, Deanie, I don't think that you did anything wrong. I th you did receive quite a bit of healing, didn't you? Oh, yes. I said, so what did, you, what did you do to receive this much? She said, well, I heard the gospel. I believed it to be true, and I got prayer. I said, and that caused you to receive as much as you did? Yes. I said, well, so what do, you ought to, what do you think you ought to do to get the rest of it? And she got quiet and she said, hear the gospel, believe it to be true and get prayer. I said, good thinking. See, the tendency is to drop back and do what we were doing before because we're not so familiar with the way that it was presented. The paradigm that I presented is a different paradigm than most, what, most of it you will hear out there. And if it works for you, you ought to stick with it. But you do have to become more familiar with it in order to stick with it. So Deanie uh, decided... Uh, Talking to her, I said, you know, go back to doing what you're doing. So she listened to CDs and she, uh, she read my books and she just meditated on that and called me in about, I guess it was like three months or so, and said, Roger, I'm completely free of cancer. But it was difficult. It was like wrestling with a crocodile. I said, uh, what does that mean? She said, well, it was slippery. She said, what you're saying is pretty simple. I get it, you know, it's done at the cross. We just have to receive it by simple faith. We get faith by hearing the good news about Jesus. I, that's pretty simple. I get that. She said, but when I had a bad night or the doctor gave me a bad report, she said, that was hard to hold on to. She said, I didn't know what to think. So what I did was I doubled up on my efforts. I prayed more. I read my Bible more. I listened to your stuff more. I did more, more, more. And she said, and it made it worse. <laughs> she said, like being dragged under by the crocodile. I just kind of felt like I was never going to get healed. You know, I was just going to die of cancer and, you know, it just wasn't working. And she said, but something you did say that was really meaningful to me, I didn't know it was going to be meaningful to me, really did work. And I said, what was that? And she said, well, you said I wasn't alone. You told me I was not alone in this, that the Holy Spirit was present in my life to make the things of Jesus real to me, that he was going to reveal to me and adjust me and fix me. Do what, you know, whatever I was unable to do, the Holy Spirit, because of my faith in Jesus, was going to help me. He was going to do the things that I didn't know to do. He was going to help me adjust. And she said, one day I was just struggling along, and all of a sudden, it just became crystal clear to me. She said, I had an epiphany. I saw very clearly, I had a revelation that I was never going to get healed by working hard at it, by reading more, by doing all these things more. And it was all about Jesus and what he had done. It was never going to be about me, that I was greatly loved, and that's all that was necessary. And she said, I said, I came to that realization. She says, it's hard to tell people that this is what it was, that, I was, that what Jesus had done was going to be enough. And she says, I was healed immediately on the spot. I knew I had gotten healed, and my doctor's given me a good report. So persistence gets the job done when nothing else does. Sticking with the Lord, focusing your attention on him, continuing to confess the truth about what he's done for you, that it is yours in Christ, that you do qualify. That's what Deanie did, and she eventually got to the place where the Holy Spirit adjusted her in that circumstance, and she was able to receive everything. So you're, turn to somebody and say, you're not alone. You're not alone. You don't have to figure this thing out on your own. 
you're not alone. The Holy Spirit is present with you to adjust you, to help you with this matter. There are two parables of persistence that Jesus teaches. One is called the friend at midnight. It's Luke's Gospel, chapter 11, verses 5 through 12. The man does not get up to give his friend the needed bread because he's his friend. He gets up because his friend keeps knocking. And in that passage of scripture, the passage says, keep and keep, it says, ask and keep asking and you shall receive. In Greek, uh, it's the continuing sense, so you would be ask and shall receive, but it's really in Greek, it says, ask and keep asking and you'll receive. Knock and keep knocking and the door will be open to you. Seek and keep seeking and you'll find. So the, those that, that, if you look in the margin of your Bible, it'll probably tell you that the Greek says, is in the continuing sense. So what is it saying to us? If we give God an opportunity like this, we stick with it. Then what happens is that is an element of faith. Persistence, remember all those people who came to Jesus and got healed that we talked about, they all had something to overcome. They all had to persist to do it. In some cases, Jesus seemed to pass them by. You remember the Bartimaeus got passed by. He cried out all the more. The two blind men in the first story about Jesus, Jesus went into the house. He cried out to Jesus and he went into the house. They had to find their way to the house where Jesus was. They had to persist in this thing. But when they did persist, they received all they needed to do. I told you the story last night of my wife who uh, got healed uh, immediately of migraine headaches, but over a period of time, of over a year period, of uh, very bad asthma. I mean, so bad that she just really couldn't breathe without serious medication. And what happened there? She persisted. She stuck with it and she was able to receive her healing completely. And this is one of the things, not everybody has to do this, but some do, and what we encourage people to do is be ready to do it, stick with it. Again, be on that journey to receive everything that Jesus has done for you. You know, don't think of it as a single event and to get disappointed and think that it's not going to happen, but rather keep your eyes on Jesus. Walk on the water with him, even if you sink a little bit. Get, let him pull you back up on the water. Peter's is still the only one that could Gives you the secret of walking on water, and that's keep your eyes on Jesus. Okay, that makes sense? Any, did I invoke any more questions? <laughs> All right, well, blessings, guys. Let's, uh, let's do some praying for each other. How's that? Anybody want to help me up here to pray for people? Mm -hmm.